Some speakers. The first speaker is Rabab Abdul Hadi. Oh, run. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just going to go alphabetically uh, with the bias. Abdul Qadir Tayyab is a professor of Islamic studies at the University of Cape Town. He obtained his doctoral degree in 1989 from Temple University. Uh, Abdul Qadir Tayyab has worked and published on Islam in South Africa and Africa, history of religions, and on the discourse of contemporary Islam. <coughs> Rabab Abdul Hadi is the director and senior scholar at the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diaspora Studies Program and associate professor of ethnic studies, race and resistance studies at the College of Ethnic Studies, San Francisco State University. She previously served as the first director of the Center for Arab American Studies at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. Uh, and Ron Greenstein is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Witherspoon. He holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin Medicine with a dissertation entitled Settlement Resistance and Conflict, Class, Nation, State, Political Discourse in South Africa and Palestine, Israel to 1949. He's an editor of Political Violence in South Africa in 1985 to 1998, Comparative Perspective on South Africa, and author of Genealogies of Conflict, Class, Identity and State in Palestine and Israel and South Africa. Uh, I'd like to call upon my first speaker, Ryan Greenstein. Uh, thank you, Mahalatsi. Um, I want to start by thanking Zane Dango for mentioning a report from 20 years ago that I co-authored, which I completely, well, not completely, but largely forgot about. And especially the argument by Jagorski, which I still remember how to pronounce his name. Um, <laughs> it, it, help, it helps to have family that comes from Poland. So, um, let me say what I'm going to speak about and what I'm not going to speak about. What I'm not going to speak about is the definition of civil society, specifically in the MENA region. And I'm not sure that such a definition is even possible or desirable. And there are two reasons for that. First, because there's no uniform notion of civil society that applies to the MENA region. Uh, rather, there are many different types of societies and states and relationship between the two uh, that are specific to different countries. So I'm not sure we can come up with a general definition of civil society that is specific to that region. And secondly, because the MENA region itself is not unique. It shares many characteristics with other parts of the world. So I'm not sure it's really uh, needed to, uh, it really needs to have its own specific definition that sets it apart from, say, Southern Africa or um, Southern Europe or various Latin America and various other parts of the world. What I am going to talk about in more general theoretical terms is about the concept of civil society and its relation to the state proceed with, with effort to adapt the concept to colonial and post-colonial conditions, and then conclude with um, possible implications of this theoretical discussion for our understanding and analysis of the MENA region specifically. First, to talk about general theoretical uh, notions of civil society. I'm just going to highlight a few theories um, cutting down on the theoretical jargon that may be relevant for us today. Starting with a prominent theorist uh, in the field, Charles Taylor, who argues that in a minimal sense, civil society is a sphere of free associations that are independent of state power. In a stronger sense, civil society is an ensemble of associations that interact with the state and can shape the course of its policy. In an even stronger sense, society as a whole may be structured and coordinated through free associations, thus reducing or even eliminating the role of the state altogether. Taylor focuses on the last two senses, which can be distinguished by the extent to which civil society seems to be complementing state power, that's the weaker sense, 
on providing an alternative to state power that's the strongest sense. And both of them present a challenge to the monopoly that the state holds on political power and on, of course, the use of violence as well. The, um, the strongest sense poses, potentially, opens up a radical challenge to establish notions of politics and state organization. What such, what such radical challenge might entail is a theme explored by Gideon Baker in his work on visions of civil society, democratic transitions, and political theory and practice in Eastern Europe and Latin America. Baker examined the conceptualization of civil society in uh, common in liberal and left political theory, and he concludes that it views civil society in instrumental terms as a counterbalance to state power. But this means the civil society itself is regarded as being apolitical, important only to the extent that it influences state policy. In contrast, he argues that we need to identify and develop an alternative view of civil society as a democratic end in itself as a space for the realization of that elusive practice of democracy, self-governance. The focus on decentralized and self-determining democratic practices is one of the implications of Baker's approach. And this discussion leaves us with three analytical challenges framing the, the, the uh, notion of civil society and its relationship to the state. The first challenge is how to combine autonomous forms of self-rule located in civil society in order to create a macro-political democratic order without undermining the vitality of the micro-foundation of politics. This means that we have to find a way of combining local self-rule but also addressing global issues of power without undermining local self-rule that is the result of dissatisfaction with global power. The second challenge is how to move beyond the definition of, this, of civil society as an independent sphere of uh, freedom and self-rule outside of state boundary, but yet remain, retain a link to the state itself um, without regarding civil society mainly as a corrective mechanism um, to state practices. And the third ch challenge is to recognize the diversity of identities and interests in the sphere of civil society. In other words, not to homogenize and assume that it's a unified actor, but without, on the one hand, creating a sense of chaos. There are so many different voices that we can't actually get a grasp on the notion. And at the same time, not uh, giving priority to some concerns of civil society at the expense of others. So how to maintain diversity and unity at the same time. All these challenges are addressed by the theoretical work of Chantal Mouf, working at times with Ernesto Laclau, who put forward the notion of radical democracy and radical democratic citizenship, which is basically a way of creating links between concerns, disparate concerns, it all shared the overall quest for greater freedom, equality, participation, and democracy. How to do that in a way that retain the distinct nature of each concern and each kind of struggle, but also creating a unifying framework, that's a challenge that we need to uh, discuss, both in the MENA region and globally. One thing that I draw on in using MOVE's approach is the notion that civil society is not a unified actor. It's a space. It's a space of, in which m multiple actors operate, interact with each other, and modify their identity in the process. So it's important for our conceptualization of the notion to understand we are not talking about a unified agent, but rather a social and political space in which many different actors operate. Some of them are progressives and others are not. Some work for greater equality and some against it. So it's not an agent that faces the state as a unified homogeneous 
agent, but rather a space which contains many different actors that sometimes can also collaborate with elements within the state and sometimes can work together with it or against it. There is no certainty, there is no inevitability about uh, this notion. The state itself, of course, is not a unified actor either, and it can also open to different forces that operate within it, sometimes in collaboration with civil society element. The conclusion of all that is that at the core of political analysis is the concrete examination of various projects at state and civil society levels aimed at bringing together different concerns under unifying themes and images. And sometimes working together with one another, sometimes they are more hostile towards one, each other, and sometimes they work at cross purposes. All these are general theoretical uh, notions that are not specific to any part of the world and definitely not specific to the Middle East. But there is a range of other studies and analyses that seek to adapt the notion of civil society or to examine the notion of civil society and its relation to the state, specifically in colonial and post-colonial contexts, which are more relevant for us here, definitely more relevant for South African civil society, but also, and that's a question that I will pose, uh, may be relevant for understanding uh, issues in the Middle East and North African region. What are these challenges to the notion of civil society? Well, one approach is to say the general theory is general. It applies everywhere, but we need to adapt it to each concrete situation. That applies to the MENA region as well as to North uh, European region or South, Southern Europe or Latin America. There's nothing specifically European or Western in these notions of civil society. But there is a different approach. Partha Chatterjee, for example, uh, recognizes that we can use the general notions of civil society as a benchmark in order to discuss issues of democracy, participation, freedoms, um, rules of engagement, and so on. But we also have to recognize that alongside civil society, and perhaps of greater relevance in post-colonial situation, we can use another notion, and that's the notion of political society. What does it mean by political society and why is it specific to the post-colonial situation? In his view, political society covers a range of behaviors and modes of organization that go beyond the traditional notion of civil society as it, normally, as it is normally understood. Post-colonial political society for Chatterjee has four distinctive features. One, many of its mobilizations are illegal, including squatting, using public property without permission, refusing to pay taxes, illegal service connection, and a lot of other activities. Second, people use the language of rights to demand welfare provision within the context of political society. Third point, the rights they demand are usually seen as being vested in, collective, in a collective or co a community, which may be very recent in origins, for example, squatters communities, and not seen as individual rights. So the collective or communal nature of protest and mobilization is central to Chatterjee's understanding of, civil, of political society. And final point, state agencies and NGOs treat these people in the framework of political society not as bodies of citizens belonging to um, lawfully constituted civil society, but as a population group that is deserving welfare. And the de degree to which they will be recognized as legitimate actors depends entirely on the pressure they are able to exert on state and non-state agents through their strategic maneuvers in political society. I think this image, this notion of political society is particularly relevant for our understanding of protest and social and political mobilization in South Africa today in the post-apartheid period, but it may be relevant for other conditions as well. This distinction, I won't go um, at length about it, but the distinction that Chatterjee draws parallels the distinction that Mahmoud Mamdani draws between um, citizens and subjects. 
So using Mamdani's uh, notion in the African context, the citizens are those who operate in the framework of civil society, and the subject largely operate within the context of political society. It's not a precise analogy, but more or less works in this way. With the major historical exception in Mamdani's argument, and that is South Africa, because of its uh, um, accelerated or expanded processes of industrialization and urbanization, South Africa is closer to the classical European definition of civil society than other countries in Africa, but it also has its own um, issues that um, makes it relevant for the notion of uh, political society. Mandami's perspective is similar to Chatterjee's in its emphasis on the limited utility of the civil society concept in understanding political organization in post-colonial societies. But whereas Mamdani focuses on its failure to address rural organization and resistance, Chatterjee focuses on its inability to include the dominant form of political um, organization among destitute urban masses. So there's distinction between the urban protest and the rural protest in both theories, but in both cases, the civil society concept captures only part of the full range of social and political forms of organization in post-colonial societies. The other African theories that I won't go into uh, in any detail that claim that the notion of civil society is completely irrelevant in African context. Just one example, Patrick Chabal and Jean-Pascal Dalloz write mostly about um, West Africa. In their book, Africa Works, Disorder as a Political Instrument, they argue that the state in, um, post-colonial state in Africa, especially in West Africa, which is the area of expertise, is devoid of legitimacy, it's a weak state, it's fully penetrated by social forces, and therefore, neither the classical political notions of the state nor the notion of civil society are relevant for our understanding of a political system which is um, dominated by patron-client networks and communal organizations, making this what they regard as a Eurocentric political framework, irrelevant for our notion. Other African theories, I just mentioned Ashim Bembe, dispute that and say that the notion of civil society, again using notions of participation, democracy, freedoms, and so on, is relevant, at least as a benchmark to which we can aspire, even if it doesn't represent the political practices that are common in many African post-colonial societies. Where do all these theoretical reflections lead to? I would say that um, we can summarize this in the following point. First of all, the concept of civil society has acquired different meanings and has been used to different ends. Mm -hmm. Most important of these meanings is, first, it uses a descriptive analytical tool to examine relations between different sectors, such as state and civil society, and their internal structure and function. But there's another meaning, which is more radical, and that it's used to challenge existing power relations and put forward an alternative radical democratic vision. From the approach to civil society as an analytical tool, uh, the main task is to examine civil society, its relationship, internal relationship between different civil society organizations, the relationship with state institutions, the role they play in service delivery, policy critique and advocacy, and so on. It's the range of issues that we are really, uh, we are generally familiar with, especially in the, in the South African context. But there is a more radical perspective, and that is the understanding of civil society as a space and an approach that challenges established power. And the main questions that emerge deal with the nature of power and resistance, the organization of elements of civil society, such as new social movements, and their applications of notion of radical democracy, and the extent to which they seek to balance the excess of excesses of established power to provide alternatives to the way in which power is conceptualized, organized, and exercised. This radical meaning of civil society is far less explored 
both analytically and in terms of political practice. But the example that is normally given as the kind of model is the, especially by people like Baker, Gideon Baker, is the Zapatista movement in Peru, eh, sorry, in Mexico, which focuses not on, not on the capture of state power, but rather of creating communal independent spaces in which people organize outside of the framework of power. To what extent this perspective allows you to challenge power as it's currently organized, that's a big question. Now, how is all this relevant for the MENA region? What are the sort of practical conclusion, analytical conclusion from that? First, we have to recognize historical specificity. Within the MENA region, as I said in the, be in the beginning, there is no unified form of state. There is no unified form of um, civil society. So we have to recognize that the MENA region itself is internally diverse. There is very little in common between consolidated states that have maintained a state structure fairly solid over decades or centuries, such as Egypt, for example, and Turkey, and Iran, and Tunisia, uh, possibly, as well, and military regimes, such as the ones that dominated uh, Syria and Iraq, and use force, physical force, military force, in order to unify regions that were quite diverse internally. And of course, there is another form of state which is characterized by dynastic, family, ethnic, tribal type of uh, political organization and rule, which characterized the Gulf states, Yemen, and Libya. So the conclusion of that is basically that the Middle East, the North African region, maybe geographic, it's, it's a ge geographical region, it's unified by some aspects of social organization, such as culture and language and possibly religion and history. But politically and socially speaking, it is an umbrella term that disguises a lot of internal diversity. So we need to look at clusters of states and society within the region rather than try to impose a unified, homogeneous um, notion on all of them, definition on all of them. Second, we have to recognize that within each state and society, there is also internal diversity. Even in countries like Egypt, let alone in other countries, there is no unified state that faces a unified civil society. So within each context, each specific context, we have to look at the arrangement of forces within these sectors of state and civil society and look at the possibilities of forming alliances between elements of the state and elements of the civil society. There are groups within the civil society that are opposed to each other. It's not a unified agent, and therefore, given that the state is not a unified agent either, it makes much more sense by way of political strategy and analyzing of politics to look at the points in which there can be intersection or collaboration or some form of cooperation between civil society organization and some state structure, rather than to conceptualize it as one unified agent facing another unified agent. And the third point is, um, that is a specific point to the Middle East region, there was, there is a tendency to look at civil society as equivalent um, to NGOs. In South Africa, we talk about NGOs and CBOs, community-based organization. In the Middle East, there is an excessive focus in general political terms, and also specifically when we talk about the Arab Spring, talking about the role of NGOs, social media, and so on. We have to recognize, with all the importance of this sector of civil society, that there is much more to the notion than this specific group of organization. So we talk about ethnic identities and political mobilization on their basis. We talk about religious movement. We talk about class forces, trade unions in particular, armed and unarmed movement, youth organization, social and political movement. It's a very diverse <coughs> reality that definitely cannot be reduced to the operation of um, NGOs and, um, and social, uh, social media types of mobilization and action. And I think I'll end on this note. Thank you very much.
you, Professor Langenstein. I'd like to call upon Abba Abdul Hadi. <laughs> Um, I first wish to, I'm actually going to resist uh, debating for now, and I'm also not going to um, spend a lot of time on um, uh, the theoretical aspect, but hopefully, hoping that will come through. Uh, first thing, I actually want to start by thanking uh, the AMEC, the Afro Middle East Center, and actually very happy to be back here in South Africa. I always say I'm honored to be back in South Africa, and I know people in South Africa debate uh, the different issues and so on. For us, for me as a Palestinian, being in South Africa is a huge honor, especially because of the ways in which people fought legal apartheid and because of the solidarity that continues to be expressed. When I was on my way coming here, I was in South African Airlines, and there was on the back of the seat a uh, sign about the Mandela's 100th anniversary. And I was centenary, and I was very excited about it. But at the same time, I was thinking, this is really great, this 100th uh, centenary of, uh, of uh, Mandela. But it also said at the bottom that we carry the legacy. You carry the legacy. And I was wondering, who is the we here? Is the we the South African Airlines? Is the we the South African people? Who is the we here? And I started thinking again about the, the symbolism, the role of symbols in the Palestinian complex, and the ways in which, immediately after the Oslo Accords, when people crossed from Jordan to the Palestinian areas through the Israeli security, there was a huge Palestinian flag that welcomed people. And Palestinians will express excitement over the flag that they went through, except that they had to go through various Israeli security checks in order to be able to see the symbolism. Mandela and the Palestinian flag are not the same, and Palestine and South Africa are definitely not the same. There are huge differences between the two, and what people have accomplished in South Africa is definitely different than what has happened in Palestine. So although I don't intend to conflate the context, but I want to be able to think about some comparative parallels. The next thing I saw on my way out of the airport was a big banner, ba panel uh, of Oliver Tembo 100th anniversary, except now this was sponsored by Samsung, which raises questions about how do we think about these national symbols that are being deployed and used in neoliberal context in a multinational corporations. And it also reminded me of the ways in which when Palestinians cross from Jordan again to Palestinian areas through Israeli um, checkpoints, there is multinational corporations, including many of them that are owned by the Palestinians themselves or controlled by Coke, for example. The last thing that was very interesting was the article in the Sunday Times of uh, Johannesburg, I guess, South Africa. And buried in the business section, it wasn't in the main section, was a big article about the so-called uh, farmers. The so-called farmers. It's very, very interesting because the article was an interview, mainly an interview, by the CEO of Land Bank. And his name, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly, Chocolo and Choco, and Choco and Chocho. And uh, the, the article was basically warning the South African president and the South African government and the South African legislators against engaging in what we would call land reform. It's land reform. It's making, by giving people who do not have land, land to be able to access it. But has been actually used by the president of the United States in order to say that this is taking away from the white farmers and killing white farmers and then reducing the agro-business. Agro-business, it is not farmers, it's not the little farmers who are sitting there tilling their little trees or whatever. The agro-business making it actually victimized by this and the article warns that the land bank would actually default on its loans if the South African government engages in something like this, and especially if blacks, and actually there's a, there's a reference there, and I have the article with me. I highlighted it all over because it seemed so interesting and the way it was being. Or, in, the same art, in the same paper, there was a, an, an op-ed 
which is very interesting also to our discussions about civil society and uh, NGOs and so on, that was written by a Patrick Gaspar, who was the US, former US ambassador to South Africa, who is currently the head of the Open Society Foundation, criticizing. So this is, it's all of this stuff comes together and basically raises the question where we are, where we are here in South Africa, how do we think about what is going on around the world? How do we think about what is happening in our region of the world? I hate the term Middle East and uh, Naim and people in Amic know that and other people. I don't <laughs> like it, Middle of the East, to whom and where and so on, but I'm not going to get into it. But to that region, how do we think about that? How do we think about various contexts and so on? And at the same time, a couple of days later, uh, the uh, Trump came out two days ago, uh, reducing, uh, cutting out $200 million to the Palestinian Authority, and basically almost eliminating UNRWA, and actually suggesting that it should be uh, joined with the International Organization of Migration, and thinking about it as, um, as within that context where UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian Refugees, was differently, and actually saying that they want to reduce the number of Palestinian refugees from 5 million to for, uh, 500,000, eliminating one of the main issues about uh, Palestine. This, all of this stuff for me brings up the question, what do we think, which uh, Zain Zangor, right? Am I saying the name correctly? You mentioned the whole question of, and uh, you began by talking about the um, uh, transitional society, but you actually mentioned towards the end post-conflict, which is what I am talking about. And actually the title that I wanted to uh, name my paper, but it was not reflected in the program, is when is civil society good and for whom? Historicizing post-conflict public space and co contextualizing prospects for justice and peace. And uh, my questions were, if the post-conflict, post-colonial state does offer indeed an expanding public space for social group mobilized around other than national structural inequalities, <coughs> gender, sexuality, class, citizenship, and so on, as the canon suggests, and if so, what tensions and contradictions emerge as anti-colonial national liberation movements originally belonging to non-governmental, such as the Palestine Liberation Organization, was a non-government, it wasn't, it wasn't a government, uh, they, and, and they reinvent themselves and emerge as internationally sanctioned and legitimized political authorities, like the Palestinian Authority. And how central are the tensions and contradictions to the very notion of the implicit goodness of civil society. So what I have done in order for me to kind of think about this, I, I started thinking, how do we think about the question of civil society? How do we think about what does this mean in our context? And taking the example of South Africa, what does it mean if we place the marginalized communities at the center of analysis rather than think about, so for example, if we think about the farmers, the black farmers who are going to be able to get, the African farmers who will be able to get the land as opposed to the agribusiness that is now constructed as victims in the discourse. How would we, if we shift the discourse and if we think about it differently, how would the picture emerge? And also, how, is, how would it emerge if we actually do not think of people who are engaged in social movement mobilization as non-state actors. In other words, we are not defining them according to state-centric <laughs> definitions, but actually see them on their own, not according to other definitions, okay? What would that, how would, how would that shift? How would that shift in the context of South Africa? And how would the whole debate shift? And how would this article in the business section of the Sunday Times disappear and basically have no argument whatsoever because the reaction to it is panic, is we need to stop that. This is now, I could see the circles of the government trying to figure out what do we do now? How are we going to respond to this? What are we going to do about it? And so on. And in, this, in, the, in the case of the question of, uh, of Palestine, are we looking at the social movement mobilization historically and contemporarily as movements that are organizing for their own liberation or are we seeing them according to a particular criteria? Okay. So I have been for a very long time based um, uh, as a journalist at the United Nations for a very long time, for 10 years, and then as somebody who actually started studying formally, not only uh, unofficially or as, as a political activist, 
issues around the whole question of Palestine since at least 1982, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. My earlier studies started around the whole question of Palestinian feminist discourses in the early 1990. And that led me to think about the question of the comparison of public space before and after uh, Oslo. And, uh, and what, I try, but I'm, what I'm going to uh, share with you is something I've been working on for, for a while, but I actually compared the, the, the post-Oslo, after Oslo, how do we think about various political movements and how do they relate to each other and what does that tell us about the context of uh, post-colonial. So as everyone knows that post-1993 Oslo was shared by political analysts, everybody had a very big euphoria around it, and uh, there, the thinking was that the PLO turned the leaf and there is uh, now a new chapter in relations. Even though Palestinians in uh, Palestinian areas, at least the West Bank and Gaza, were not, not everybody was as enthused about it, they still hoped that the, uh, the Palestinian Authority will actually allow for the enjoyment of civil, political, and social rights that were delineated in the Palestinian Declaration of Independence that was adopted almost 30 years ago in Algiers in uh, 1988. However, and I don't know how many people know, but the, within a year, the Palestinian Authority uh, started turning, everything turned around. The first order of business was setting up 13 security, police and security agencies. Prisoners in Palestinian custody were tortured to death. Reports of widespread conf conf uh, corruption were, um, the, uh, they were uh, coming out. And within three years, which was actually the, the, the deadline for the final resolution, status resolution, uh, there is much more human rights abuses that are going on, and there was a lot of criticism of the PA. Theoretically, these conditions would indicate that public space for oppositional cultures has shifted. So public space for people who are opposing should shift. But if this were the case, and if public space has actually shifted, we, there is a puzzle that we need to um, explain, and namely the puzzle of the idea of the model um, parliament on women and legislation. That was actually quite welcomed by the Palestinian Authority as opposed to political, um, organ political act, uh, opposition. It, this was the, the model parliament held in two places in the West Bank and Gaza, brought together Palestinian women and men, lawyers, professionals, religious, clerics, academics, and intellectuals, activists, leaders of NGOs, as well as members of the Palestinian parliament, legislatures, which were also part of the Palestinian government. Around the clock security was provided for the model parliament. That was a social movement for the Palestinian Authority. By contrast, a little over a year, 20 prominent Palestinian intellectuals, academics, legislators, and professionals some of whom were also affiliated with the modern parliament, released a statement criticizing the Palestinian Authority for its dismal track record and failure to meet Palestinian national goals. The release of political prisoners from Israeli jail, dismantling of Jewish settlements, return of Palestinian refugees and expatriates, the creation of an independent Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital, etc., etc. The reaction of the Palestinian Authority, which was until 1993, Non-governmental organization, a liberation movement, non-state actor, was immediate. They denounced the statement as divisive. In less than 24 hours, they basically arrested five of the people who, are, who signed it, including the mayor of Nablus, who was elected in 1976 on a pro-PLO, anti-colonial nationalist slave, and whose legs were blown up by a car placed in his, by a bomb placed in his car by uh, Jewish settlers from the settlements in 1980. And the following day, it was the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. The PA arrested more people, and one of the leading advocates actually was beaten up as he went to visit prisoners in prison and spent three months in, in the hospital. There is a very stark difference between the treatment of the modern parliament, i.e. women's organizing, which is supposed to actually not be the term of the day, the norm of the day, and that of the political uh, opposition. So this is a dilemma. How do we understand this? What do we understand? How does this mean? What does this mean for the question of post-conflict reconstruction or post-conflict? If mobilizing space narrowed under the PA rule, the statement, the relationship, the treatment of the statement differs of the way the, the treatment of the women. 
people who celebrated Oslo, thought that the PLO was rehabilitated, transformed its leadership from an organization of outlaw terrorists into statesmen. They posited that the creation of the PA made possible the proliferation of civil society institutions. They pointed to the large number of NGOs. There were very small numbers, and all of a sudden we had 4,000 NGOs signing up, registering post-Oslo, post-1994, actually. And these views also resonated with the received wisdom in, in the canon. Aside from someone like Charles Tilly, who actually argued that state making is an organized crime. And it's a very small pamphlet, actually, it doesn't really get much play, but he goes through the creation of the European state in the, in, in, in the European state and talks about it, calls it actually state uh, organized crime, state making as organized crime. The majority have posted that post-conflict is more tolerant of debates and democratic interaction and more conducive to a flourishing civil society than the chaos of conflict-ridden national liberation movements. This, this viewpoint was inspired by East European oppositional movements against centralized authority, the colored revolution. And, uh, and, uh, and scholars base their arguments on the assumption that as national movements turn their attention to state building, charismatic leadership is routinized, order settles in, and public space expands, and a thriving civil society becomes the mark of states, not of non-state or regular anti-state movements. <coughs> if we assume that the Oslo process actually had a short end, a new era of civility, and civility takes a new uh, meaning today, and a hospital in public space, there are many things that contradict that. So for example, the enthusiasm, embrace, the enthusiastic embrace of the modern parliament on women and legislation by the official state apparatus, the Palestinian Authority, international agencies, and NGO community, Public space here opens up for specific forms of collective action. The reason has to do with the extent to which any given movement relates to the status quo. So while the, the, the prominent figures, for example, who, were, who protested and were penalized, they were opposed to the Palestinian Authority and, they, and the basis for its existence, they were opposed to the Oslo Accord. The modern parliament did not have a fundamental contradiction with the Palestinian Authority and its premise. If anything, the modern parliament had drawn its legitimacy from the environment, the environment of euphoria over the post-conflict construction and actually benefited from it. Second, in many ways, the modern parliament resembled PA bodies and their mode of professional behavior in more than 20, in much more than the way the opposition figures did. As a matter of fact, the latter, the, the opposition figure, acted in a way to signal their total rejection of the form and content of the Palestinian Authority. They denounced its policy, they likened them to those that were adopted by the Israeli military occupation. Basically, they called it a colonial setup. But when the modern parliament, the modern parliament, on the other hand, was acting in sync with the times of the PA and Oslo. So the political, but the political opposition was out of sync with the spirit and the letter of the post-Oslo and the post-conflict. Three. The modern parliament was supported financially and politically by the European Union, other governmental and non-governmental agencies and donor organizations. Those same international bodies and organizations were not interested at the time in hearing the opposition's complaints regarding the Palestinian Authority, nor the harsh and brutal treatment of its opponents. If you recall, people who recall or look at history, at that time, every, nobody wanted to hear any criticism of the Palestinian Authority. It was a question of how you would allow the Palestinian Authority to function better, how would you train its um, security uh, forces, how would you bring more General John and General this and that to, yeah. Uh, 
to uh, to be to train the, the security forces and so on. But there was the question of criticizing the Palestinian Authority or the Oslo framework was non not acceptable, non-existent. Okay, any questions about that, and especially after the Aqsa Intifada, any entertainment of any criticism of that was not acceptable, was not allowed in mainstream and hegemonic uh, sources, and as well and in many academic and, and political uh, spaces as well. It took a very long time until, and I'll, 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 I'll end with that. I am um, actually not covered. So, I will try to summarize. Yeah. Okay. So, so the international agencies were supporting them. The, uh, they also, this international agency provided the cushion of support for the modern parliament, not for the, not for the, the opposition. The, mother, the international and the modern parliament actually also saw its audience as the international agencies, as the NGOs, and not the Palestinians who were supposed to be accountable to it. And they also did not see the Palestinian women whose interests they were supposed to uh, serve as some of the people they needed to talk to or those who needed, they needed to raise uh, money from. The last point is I, in, the, that, that in, 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 in this, and I will have another minute. Uh, no, no, I will <laughs> the, the, the last point is that with these, with these two examples, is really focuses on the question of the post in the post conflict. And I think one of the main issues is the whole question in which the historical period, the historical period of the past is completely isolated. And then we start talking about post colonial as if we arrived at the post colonial. When we are not, we're still working with colonial legacies. This is the same example of what's happening with the farmers here and with the other struggles, the fees must fall, the, what's happening with the students, what's happening with everywhere else is that the process doesn't end. The, that's just because people call it post-conflict or call it post, which means it just ended. It does not signal its ending. There are a lot of legacies as Franz Fanon and many other quote-unquote post-colonial, and I think they are studies of colonialism, not post-colonial theories, but somebody named them as such. Uh, argue. It is, it's continuous. It's much harder to actually uh, engage in the process of getting rid of the colonial legacies than signaling and making an announcement that this is where we are at. So I want to just mention one more. I'm not going to continue with this case, but I want to mention one thing that actually came. Uh, yeah, I'm ending on that. Uh, one, one thing that actually came that gives us a very interesting example is that there was a discussion about all of these oppositional movements and the whole discussion about Oslo was uh, pretty much non-existent until fast forward to actually 2005 and we see the repercussions later. And specifically with the Palestinian core and it's called civil society and I actually do not agree that it is civil society for boycott, divestment and sanctions. It is not civil society core. Because if you look at it, and I went over it, and I printed it in all the five or six languages in which it's printed. And it, it's, not, it's not what is called civil society. What is supposed to be understood as civil society, actually the people who are signing it, the first list is Islamic and national groups. This is the political factions that are actually fighting Israel. Some militants, some are not, and so on. There are groups everywhere. There are multiple Arab groups. There are groups in the US. There are groups in Canada. There are... It is not just actually Palestinian civil society. I think it sounds really good for people to say it is the Palestinian civil society that called. And actually, majority of the groups in the Palestinian society have signed on the BDS since then and more until now. But it is not civil society per se. And naming it as civil society, I believe, misses the boat in understanding what social movements do and how social movements work. So going back to my first original point of I'm going focusing to is on the under-marginalized, <laughs> I just want to say that it is really important, just like in South Africa, with the question of thinking about the farmers and the land, it is really important to hear the analysis of Palestinian refugees and what are people on the ground saying and doing every single day about it in the great march of return in Gaza and everywhere else in order to respond to Trump and his policies and his attempts to eliminate the Palestinian post. So.
and correct you, actually updated the program to the topic you wanted, except the brief. Yes, apologize. Our next speaker is Abdul Qadir Tayo. So, thank you very much, first of all, for organizing this conference and for the invitation, and thank you, all of you, for being here. I am uh, speaking to my PowerPoint presentation. I need to turn it a little bit like this. I hope you don't mind that, so I have to see it. But I think I can control it from here. But yeah. okay. So I'm uh, talking about uh, Islamism and civil society. I've added a slight uh, uh, subtitle to it in order to indicate where I am uh, heading with this uh, particular presentation. The problem is I don't remember my whole talk, but I don't have it in front of me, so I have to keep on talk, turning around and seeing what I, what I wrote, in, uh, at least in my pre presentation. So I'm thinking about civil society as sharing a public space, and I'm going to ask how various, uh, how Islamist groups, and particularly my focus is going to be on Egyptian groups, because uh, it's just more manageable to look at them, but also the Egyptian groups have been very influential. I don't necessarily mean to say that there are no other groups that have been thinking about this, but at least to begin to have a conversation about how, how, how Islamist groups and how Islamist intellectuals have been thinking about uh, civil society public spaces. But the main question that I want you to raise is this... Uh, The main question that I wanted to raise is this idea of sharing a space. So I start from the idea of, um, that we have heard already that perhaps we need to think about whether the term is actually uh, useful or not. And there have been some questions raised in the literature in Islamic studies, particularly by Muhammad Arkun and uh, Filali Ansari, who suggest that perhaps this is another of those terms used, especially in the 1980s and 90s, in order to not only to assess uh, societies, but also to judge them. That whether these, the, the, the judgment is that this is what Western societies are, or Westernized societies are, and not necessarily, particularly when it comes to uh, Middle Eastern societies or Islamic societies, that they're not quite uh, you know, uh, on, on the same par. This is a, it's used as a kind of a yardstick as such. So with that, I'm aware of this uh, problematic of that term, uh, so therefore I want to take a slightly different approach to addressing this uh, problem. So I'm approaching the question by asking, you know, who is uh, permitted to be in this public sphere? Uh, the, I'm going to ask about w how hospitable is the, is, this, is the public sphere? Uh, and that is a question that I, I think that has been raised by Islamist groups because it is, also, it is also a question that goes back a very long time in the past, in, the, in, the, in, in classical Islamic tradition, about you know, what do you do with the other in the public sphere? Who is the other in the public sphere? And what do you do? What is your responsibility towards the other in the public sphere? So I know there are many other questions that we have heard today about you know, power and, and the relationship between state and society, but I'm also thinking about the public sphere as a, I want to pose this question with, with respect to Islamist discourse as a, as a hospitality that is given to people in the, in, in the, in the public sphere as such. So the, one of the first questions that is raised in, in, in the, the, one, the question that is raised in theology and also in the contemporary literature is who is a Muslim? And this is re with regard to uh, the Muslims who are um, you know, the Muslims who are other than oneself. As you know, there are many different, uh, uh, you know, uh, factions or different uh, sects, what we call perhaps, or other groups, firaq in Arabic, and these groups are the Sunnis, the Shiites, the Kharijites, all of the other groups. Are they Muslims? You know, does it make them Muslim? And this is one of the very earliest questions that was raised in Islamic theology. I'm not going to go through all of that. Maybe we can talk about it if you feel it's important. But it started off with asking, who make, what is a legit, legitimate ruler? When an iniquitous ruler, or a ruler that is, does not conform to, the, uh, conform to justice, or doesn't conform to the acceptable norms in a society, is, can one say that person is no longer a Muslim? And there were some position, people who were doing, making that position, and there were others who were taking, there was a whole lot of a considerable debate in the first two or three hundred years, that, that, that establishes the foundation of what makes a Muslim a Muslim. 
Uh, and and th that is the, the sort of a question that I'm going to draw on, uh, at least in the, my discussion of the uh, contemporary debates. Another, another important question that was raised is that who uh, is the non-Muslim, is a religious group, uh, people who are particularly, this question was related first to the Jewish and Christian groups and later as uh, Muslims went to other places as the Islamic um, you know, political entities expanded, that question was addressed to other religious groups as well, like, for example, Hinduism or African religions as well. So the question there was, does, is, is, one, is the public space hospitable to somebody, a group, a religious group, that is outside Islamic fold as such? So there is a kind of a plurality that has to be discussed, you know, the hospitality within as well as the hospitality among uh, religious groups as well. So the main question that I have is, that I want to pose is that coming back from having given that kind of a framework, is the hospital, is the space hospitable? Can one share a, a public space? And if one looks at the, uh, you know, the theory of Habermas, whose uh, work from the 1960s has been, was, re, was sort of uh, re-dusted off and brought back into the discussion in the 1980s, you know, with, the, with, the, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the developments uh, in the 1990s throughout the global world, his theory is underlying the idea of a rational deliberation that marks the public space. So in a sense, his theory was that what you do is that you have to take, you know, if it, once the religion leaves the public space or the feudal laws, you know, leave the public space because they are the ones who have occupied it with power, then you could have rational deliberation. And so you could see that how uh, the, uh, the question of, of hospitality from his perspective is answered by, well, if we, if we enter the public space, we use rational deliberation as such, or we decide on the basis of how we agree or disagree among themselves. The other uh, person who has been quite influential in the, study of, in the study of religion is Eisenstadt, who disagrees with Habermas' idea of, the, of civil society, and rather I, um, says that basically rather than starting from a European model, one, one should do is look at a longer history of human societies and look at rather at public spaces, and these public spaces are not so much determined by you know, a, a, a discourse that is shared, but rather forces, uh, different forces that are occupied in the society, and the different, um, and the kind of balance between these forces as such. So for Eisenstadt, he, when he looked at the history of Indian society, or history of China, or, or the history of Islam, he basically argued that much one can think about public spaces not necessarily from the position of lack of what is happening elsewhere, but rather think about a balance of forces that one can think about in a public sphere. And I think one can hear some of our discussion this morning here as well. Okay, so and let me move on. Okay, so I want to start, um, the aim of my paper is actually to show you some of the changing um, ideas among Islamists in Egypt with respect to uh, the other the other that is within Islam and, and the other with respect to a religious group that does not belong to Muslim, or at least in this case, I'm speaking specifically, specifically mo mostly the discussion starts with Jewish and Christian groups as such. So, but before I do my own analysis, I want to relate to you two, uh, I think, significant contributions to the discussion that I think that I found very helpful and that I would like to share with you that maybe we could, we, I, I, that I found useful to begin with. And the first is that by, uh, of, of the work of Muhammad Fadil, who I think is well known to AMEC, um, uh, AMEC conference uh, attendees here, who has written a very interesting article on how co uh, contemporary Egyptian scholars, including Islamists, but not only Islamists, have begun to think differently about you know, the, the, the salvation of the other. Is the other person self? I mean, and often this is the way in which religious discourse will work, right? So, for example, is it is the is the is the Jew or the Christian uh, or somebody who is not a Muslim would he have salvation in the year after? And that often means the way that you think about the other person in the in, in the public space that you are sharing with them. And Muhammad Fadil showed, for example, that over the course of the 20th century, that the discourse changed from medieval a medieval discourse which was based on rationality. By which I mean that religious scholars in the, in the medieval period, Muslim, Sunni Muslim scholars, were arguing that once you hear about Islam, then it is your responsibility as a rational person to know that that's the truth. You don't necessarily need to be, nothing else needs to be done for you. In fact, they even suggested that even Muslims have to use a rational argument. If they don't use a rational capacity to really believe what is true, 
then they might have to suffer some punishment in the year after as well. But generally the argument was from the theologians that you need to have some kind of rational conviction and you have to do that as a rational being. But what he showed is that in the course of the, of the 20th century, so Islamic scholars started moving the focus away from a rational basis of belief to the, to the responsibility of the Muslim to represent Islam. So rather than saying that it is the Christian or the Jew who is responsible for his salvation, and he's responsible for his salvation, that means he must become Muslim or a Jew, he says that in the 20th century, scholars began to say that, well, it is the responsibility of the Muslims to actually take the ideas or to, to represent Islam in a good way. And the reason why Jews and Christians are not becoming Muslim is because Muslims are not a good representation of Islam. And I think you can see the shift taking place, the implication of what Muhammad Fadil is showing is a discourse moving from a, a kind of a rational discourse, which is about debate, to a discourse that Europe Muslims have to present themselves in the public sphere. They have to present a good image of Islam, both in themselves as well as what they say about Islam. Picking up from this idea, there's another uh, interesting scholar who is um, Jamal Malik, who has looked at uh, the literature on da'wah in the, also in the course of the 20th century, also within Egypt. And he has also recognized an interesting shift in, 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 in relation to the fact that whereas previous, previously the word da'wah means mission, mission or proselytization, and whereas previously the word da'wah did not really <coughs> occupy such an important place in the life of every individual Muslim as such. I know many of you might disagree with that, but we can talk about it in the, in the discussion. But what he says, in the 20th century, da'wah became part of sharia, of the, of, of the language of fiqh, of jurisprudence. And so there's a juridification of da'wah. That means everybody, just like they have to perform prayer and zakah or give, perform the other duties, now they also have to proselytize as well. And then they, the proselytization meant that the state, that what you, what you get is that rather than the state being responsible for da'wah in the past, now individuals are responsible for da'wah as, as, as well. So you can see in both of the writing the responsibility shifting to the public sphere, to the responsibility of the individuals doing something for themselves. So I think you can clearly see what I'm hoping to show with this, that there's, a, there's some level of the transformation of the classical, classical questions. Where the classical questions, theological questions were turning around, is a non-Muslim saved? I'm sorry for using the word non, but is a Jew or a Christian or other religious people saved? Or what to do with non-conformist Muslims? What to do with Muslims who are not exactly like yourself? Now the question is the responsibility of Muslims to represent, to present and represent Islam. So it becomes a kind of a mission activity that one enters into the public, uh, into the public space. Okay, so how does that happen with religious discourses? I know I'm probably running short of time, right? So, do I have um, about five minutes? Can I do that? Okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a, uh, what, what I've, I've divided um, the discourse of the Islamists into two phases. One is what I would call, consider to be the foundations. Uh, foundations that were established by uh, people like uh, Hassan al-Banna mm -hmm. and, and Sayyid Qutb. Um, and then, let me present that all to you so you can just hear what I'm going to say. I'm gonna, this is a, uh, the foundations were established in the first half of the 20th century, where generally the ideas were developed, generally borrowed from um, from early 20th century you know, political movements like socialism and nationalism, and then using those as a mirror by which to represent Islam. So Hassan al-Banna, for example, I can only go through a few examples. Yeah, Hassan al-Banna, these are, uh, for example, spoke about Islam in comparison with nationalism and socialism. He said that Islam is a da'wah, a mission, just like nationalism is a da'wah, or just like socialism is a da'wah. This is verbatim, or it is paraphrase of his ideas. Or he spoke about the Islam of the Muslim brothers as opposed to the Islam of the Persians, or the Islam of other people. So what, what you get is that the construction of Islam, in this case, is really framed in the context of ideologies and, and a very, uh, very, very uh, circumscribed definition of what Islam is in this case, using the language of, of the time as such. This was then further developed by uh, Sayyid Qutb through the influence of Mawdudi, making even stronger the kind of ideological commitment and ideological closure that is determined what is, what is in the context of Islam as such. 
So when, when to, towards the end of the 20th century, or by the time um, you know the 1960s uh, emerged as such, we have to ask whether their discussion of the public of a shared public sphere has actually completely disappeared. The Islam becomes is, is represented as an ideology. Uh, it is represented as a uh, modern, modern, and, and especially 19th century scientific discourse is used as a model to speak about Islamic law, certainly by Sayyid Qutb. I'm just going to leave that here. You can ask me the question for elaboration. So there is no shared space for the other within as well as the other outside as such. In the second half of the 20th century, then, you get some important revisions taking place. And the revisions are very much in the line of what Muhammad Fadil and, um, and uh, Jamal Malik were writing about. But I'd like to share two of the major books that, were, that emerged from, from among, the, among the Muslim brothers that speak about a very different kind of discourse. The first one is that of uh, Hassan Hudaybi. The, book that, uh, the title of the book is called uh, Du'at la Qudat, which means we are missionaries, not judges. And in this particular book, it's a full attack on Mawjudi's understanding of, uh, uh, of Islam, understanding of the religious uh, discourse. And uh, Udaybi draws on classical Islamic traditions to suggest that, well, in order for you to, in order for you to recognize another person as Muslims, you should, you, you should actually, do not necessarily need to look at what, they, what, what, they, what, what kind of practices they, 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 they perform, but look at the, at the fact that they, are, they declare themselves to be Muslim. He came close to uh, taking a very uh, a classical Islamic traditional position of the Murjia, which emerged early in Islamic history, which was um, uh, later anathemized, was declared to be Kufr. But the Murjia is associated sometimes in the literature with some of the earliest scholars like Abu Hanifa. And it comes close to, I'm sorry to use the term, but close, close to what we speak about as a kind of a liberal tradition. But what you need to do is this, you have, your, your belief is important, your statement of the belief is important, and beyond that, we have to agree to disagree with each other. Perhaps that is a little bit of oversimplification, but nevertheless, I'm going to, Udevi draws on this longer tradition in order to make space for the Muslim other. The other interesting book that, was, that came out also in 1990, in the, uh, in the, in the 20th century, I meant to say, it's called, uh, it's entitled, Muwatinun uh, La Dhimiyun. Uh, translated, it means citizens, not subjects. And this book is directly addressed to uh, Jews and Christians, particularly in Egypt, the Christians who are uh, uh, living in Egypt, and, um, and, and um, uh, Fahmi Huwaidi develops a strong critique, or at least a representation, another representation of Islam in this case, just like following up on, on, on Hudaybi before him, but this time he is emphasizing his approaches, he is emphasizing um, a common humanity. He draws on verses of the Quran, many hadith of, the, of, of, of hadith texts of the Prophet, which speaks about the dignity of people, uh, the dignity of individuals that that is fundamentally important to recognize, but quite important as well. So he takes a, in Islamic tradition we speak about a maqasid approach, uh, 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 an approach that. Uh, that works very closely, one might say, with the idea of rights as such. But not exactly the same, but let me again leave something open for you for the discussion. What is also important, that what he does also say, is that he does, in, in about half of the book, he discusses the discrimination that one finds in the Quran and Hadith towards uh, Jews and Christians as well. But he suggests that these uh, traditions are, should be understood in the historical context. In the context when there was a lot of hostility, there was a lot of uh, 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 um, uh, discrimination against other religious groups, against a conflict going on. So in that context, one, should, one, had, one expected this kind of relationship to exist. But what he concludes with is to say that his approach um, prepares a space for a better space for tablir, a better space, better space for mission. Just like what I was saying, what Jamal Malik and others have said as such. So I, I want to make, make a few concluding remarks on what I have presented to you. And, oops, sorry. I think next time I would advise you to have a computer here so I can show it. Just so. Okay, so maybe I'd like to just look at it. I'm used to just looking straight at people, so right, I'm, I'm finding a bit uh, uncomfortable looking at the screen. So 
In fact, when we all, often tell students this, when you do a presentation, you never look this way. But anyway, now I'm having to do that. <laughs> so certainly, I, what I wanted to say is that one can cl clearly see an additional discourse on the other, you know, three, throughout the process of the, particularly in this case, the Muslim Brothers. And I think one can find similar kinds of developments elsewhere because these books and ideas are shared across. So what is interesting is that the resources are found in traditional Islamic discourse. So previously, I think that the, the idea was much more to match what is going on in Western discourse. But here, when you see the changes coming up, the changes are coming up also drawing on traditional Islamic discourse, which obviously we don't have time to look at as such. But I think what one also needs to decide is that this new discourse of rights or the new discourse of of, of openness, or maybe if I can call it a kind of hospitality, stand side by side with this earlier discourse. So, like Ibrahim Musa has said in some of his working in Islamic discourse, when you have new ideas coming up, they don't necessarily replace the old one. What you have is that, the, you know, what you would have a much more uh, uh, antagonistic or inhospitable discourse towards the other, side by side with a hospitable discourse within Islamist discourse, mm -hmm. within Islamist, Islamist tradition as such. More importantly, the, the other point is that the public sphere is informed by da'wah, is informed by missionary, by a sense of mission, that you have to do things in the public sphere from the perspective of Islamists that in order to convert or in order to represent Islam to the other. Now, initially when I thought about this, I thought, well, it seems that there's no place for real rational deliberation. It probably means that there's going to be a lot of apologetic, uh, apologetic uh, you know, statements or apologetic stances that are made within the public sphere. And perhaps one sort of misses the idea of common causes that are going to be taking place, or at least but among different groups as such. These are all, the first one where I put the question marks are all possibilities that one thinks about religion in the public space, not necessarily as a, a public space as a place where you're going to have proselytization. But I want to conclude by perhaps arguing that maybe this is a more realistic framework for thinking about religion in a public space as such. So if one looks at how within Islamist discourse in okay. Egypt as such, how it has moved you know, from a completely inhospitable and antagonistic discourse towards the other, other within and without, now you have a discourse which is focused on da'wah, which is focused on mission, which can perhaps take on different forms as such. So it's, it's, it, uh, what, I'm, what I'm leaving you with, one should not necessarily, as I did at my first uh, reading of it, you know, discount the value of this transformation of discourse. And if one goes back to Habermas, uh, Habermas in particular, <laughs> sorry, sorry, okay, <laughs> somebody's talking over that side. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so one sentence, if I could do that. So I think. If one thinks about Habermasian discourse of rational deliberation, we often think about this is a you know, perfect example of rational deliberation. But by the time Habermas was writing about this in the 1960s, he had already said that the discourse was actually, rational deliberation had actually been destroyed by state power and by media. So I think basically we need to think about these other kinds of discourses that are coming out, you know, not only in Islamic tradition, but other traditions, cultural traditions, perhaps we can actually think more creatively about the public space. Thank you. Um, thank you to all our speakers. Now I'd like to open up to the floor. I'm sure a lot of people have questions. Uh, thank you. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Uh, we should. Do we need microphones? Or? Yes, they do. Ah, okay. Um, Thank you very much. So thank you for these very rich uh, presentations. Um, I'm not one to get bogged down in, in theoretical questions overly much, um, but in all the talks, right, the concepts of, of civil society, the central analytical concepts of the conference, civil society, non-state actors, in various ways were, were brought up. So I wonder if this might be a moment to, to, to think about them a little more. Um, Ram offered a perspective in which either state or society uh, should be seen as, as a unified actor, right, monolithic or even necessarily coherent. Um, but I wonder how far that gets us, and if it's not, um, we're thinking about some approach which, which questions that binary in the first place, right, of, of a state uh, and of a society and sees them both as something which come from somewhere, right, which, which as categories, very powerful categories, right, which govern our lives in many ways, uh, were historically, socially, politically um, constructed. 
there's there's a implication, it seems to me, uh, an assumption, right, that civil society is inherently oppositional in much of our usage, right? Whereas, of course, we think of any historically existent society, um, many members of that society share a dominant ideology, right, which is that of the state. Others not, of course, right? So that has to be taken into account. Uh, and civil society can, of course, not necessarily, but can, of course, align all sorts of other differences. Distinctions, and again, it has to do with the origin of this concept in 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 its more modern usage, right? Out of Eastern Europe, like <coughs> Adam Shurovsky and others, right? Uh, in, in in as a way, as a very politically useful way, right? And it remains instrumentally useful. And I don't want to downplay that, but uh, again, from a scholarly perspective, it seems these categories need to be questioned um, further. Um, and we need to think about the ways in which um, you know, forms of social contention. Are, are shaped by, by practices, institutions that we, we name the state, right, and vice versa. So to think about the naming uh, and what underlines that naming and the politics of that, that naming on, on both sides rather than accepting them as um, somehow naturally constituted uh, or that binary is somehow naturally constituted. Um, Zach, he yes. Yeah. yes, finally, just, just a, a word. I mean, and that made me think, I'll recall there if I may, um, the, the notion that the, the, the 20th century fiction of Sharia as something, right, pristine and, and coherent and unified and as something which governed pre modern societies with it, which, with, before the bad states took over, the bad secularizing and modernizing states. Um, <laughs> as we know, historically, in fact, right, um, there was Siasa. Right, which, which for most, most Muslim jurists was very much complementary to or even part of Sharia. <coughs> right, so again, it's that that state society uh, binary. It's worth, I think, further thought. Yeah, uh, my recent question that it tends to to win. Uh, I want to join your, your initial opening comments of the variant, the variant forms in which particular actors find themselves, including the state. Uh, to the last comment where you suggested an alliance between or among the players and time. Uh, looking at the entire course of social materialism, are you in a way, because we can't form an alliance for the benefit of either of the two. It must be something that it really brings together uh, a particular interest, perform something anew. Are you in a sense suggesting that we are by ourselves, finding ourselves moving towards that ultimate point of a stateless society? Thank you for the very fascinating panel. I have a quick question for uh, Professor Dr. Karel Tayor. When I think of the, the other within, uh, both in the so-called Western intellectual tradition and uh, the Arab intellectual tradition, I think of women, you know, as uh, it has been uh, theorized by Simone de Beauvoir on one side and by Fatima Bernice on the other. So I was wondering, what is the space that uh, intellectuals like Zainab al-Razali, Safina Skazem, Heather Hurrell-Fizat uh, occupy in uh, the genealogy you traced? Uh, and uh, how do they theorize the, the other within? Um, I'm uh, give the panel a chance to respond, and then we'll take another set of uh, hands. Um, I think, well, first of all, about the comment by Zachary Lockman, I, I agree fully. It's uh, counterproductive. It's not very useful <coughs> to look at state and civil society as uh, mutually exclusive categories and uh, forces that um, treat each other uh, Oppositions uh, in, in oppositional terms and internally homogeneous. So I think that's my experience. It's more practical experience than, than academic uh, sort of 
theory. Um, in the South, South African context, we saw many examples in which, in which um, productive policies came out as a result of interaction between and collaboration between elements of the state and elements of civil society, uh, rather than opposition between them. And so I think in practical terms, definitely, there is room for alliances, collaboration on specific programs between elements, forces within civil society and forces within the state. And while all of us, it's easy to recognize that civil society is internally diverse, we also need to recognize that the state, in many cases, I, I wouldn't generalize about all states, but in many cases, definitely in South Africa, and I think in many Middle Eastern countries, um, the state is also internally diverse, and civil society, progressive civil society forces have to take advantage of fissures and divisions within state agencies in order to advance uh, the progressive agenda. I, I think it covers the other question as well. Uh, the notion that uh, I, I don't see a future of uh, stateless. Um, I, I, let me put it this way. I think that the, the, the usefulness, the utility, of more radical conceptualization of civil society is the notion that it can create spaces for operation outside of state boundaries. Not to replace the state altogether, but to extend the to create spaces in which you don't have to engage the state directly. But I don't think it can um, come, conclude with uh, eliminating the state altogether. It may be a very nice goal to, to have, but it's not uh, realistic, not today and not uh, in the near future. The terms are problematic. That's why I try to find a different way of approaching them to, to turn to because obviously my talk was on uh, on Islamic intellectuals, I thought that rather than starting from, you know, from from the familiar territory, familiar familiar framework, and then see where they are, how they are not something, so that is why it sort of shows a, a discourse, a, dis a discussion that that went, that started, emerged early early in um, in Islamic history and such. And I think your comment, I'm going to use your comment about the Sharia and the state, uh, also to respond to the other question, but. But, I mean, I want to address your question separately, but, but at the same time there's a link between that, because the Mawjuji, for example, in the 1930s was arguing that Islamic law is exactly like uh, natural law, uh, a physical, natural, scientific law. So he was looking at the scientific laws which govern the universe, and he said, well, that's the same law that governs you know, human society. But he's got a very interesting uh, discussion. What do you do with laws in the Quran? You, you say that different people have different laws or the laws change. He sort of just look, overlooks that. But it has been, even though it is, um, it is a, it, 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 an idea has been replaced, but it, it has been a very powerful idea uh, among uh, contemporary Muslims, 20th century Muslims, to think about Islamic law as scientific in that way. So sometimes these terms, even if they are wrong, they can actually have a, a, a sort of a very long endurance, you know, in societies as such. So your question about the other within, yeah, thank you very much. You know, that's also the, the risk of starting from where they were in the Muslim discourse. They never discussed that. Certainly, they were concerned about what is the Muslim, what the Muslim who doesn't practice Islam, and so then they never raised the question of women. So for me, there was a little bit of blindness there that I didn't look at. But if I think about the work of um, uh, uh, certainly the work that I've looked at of Hanushi and, uh, as, as opposed to people like Mawjudi and also I've looked at um, uh, Mutahari, the Iranian intellectuals. So there's a struggle between using a kind of a scientific discourse to speak about gender. That was the earlier 20th century discourse about, you know, gender is scientifically determined. And then in the later part, people like Hanushi try to move away from that by draw to, to picking up on rights and issues of rights. But there's a limitation of those rights. Both Ghanoushi in, in Tunisia as well as Khaldawi and Khaldawi and Ghanoushi share the same idea. They, they certainly limit the, uh, the, the responsibility, engagement of women, even in the revised versions. They don't necessarily, for example, see women as taking on position of you know, full authority in the state, or you know, they never even consider whether women can actually become leaders in the mosque. But I am not necessarily want to point out what they know, I'm just speaking about the fact that there is there's certainly a struggle with, with, with the discourse that they then adopt in the, in the, in the, in the 21st century. Can I just say? Oh, 
Okay, yeah. So I think um, uh, I, I agree with uh, Zach about the need to think about the whole question of society and state and so on. And I think part of the problem is that we, our study of state is our study here and our understanding and our study of state civil society relations and state, non-state and so on is governed by a particular of understanding and genealogy of the state that begins at a particular time in a particular European context. So actually, until uh, you begin to speak, uh, when you think about the state, you're not thinking about the Islamic state at all. You're thinking about the European state in this particular discourse and this particular formation. So then people go into particular spaces that then, and also when you bring in Habermas and so on, it does not really even talk about the discussions of civil society, whether it was Marx or the whole discussion of the Tocqueville or the discussion of the Greeks and so on. I mean, all of this stuff kind of like escapes, but today civil society becomes a catchword for what is civil, A, it's not 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 uh, not uncivil as opposed to uncivil, and specifically in discussions, what's acceptable, what is the acceptable way, which reminds me of Norbert Elias' book of the civilizing process and how that uh, works out. And but but I think the other aspect of it is I'm 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 thinking about that, and I'm thinking about some of the books like bringing the state back in as if the state escaped because scholars decided that actually. They weren't thinking about the state, and now they decided to bring the state. They, they bring the state back in, and then people start talking about that every single day. So, but the other aspect of it is, um, I don't want us to lose sight of the structural aspect of it and the ways in which there is an overarching power that is vested with the state, as opposed to people who are outside of the state and how do they how do they manage to navigate in order for them to survive? So that's the other the, the other uh, thing that I just want to add about the whole question of gender. That I think I mean the whole even not thinking about only the voices of women, but thinking about how the history has been gendered and sexualized. So when it is gendered, it's not just about women per se, but it's about gender subject and the, like the, the the so there is a lot kind of like analysis about the whole question of quote unquote the hermaphrodite. That what, what you might say trans today, or I think there is a lot of rich history that actually really requires to be part of the discussion because that, that also affects to what extent the state is strong or weak and how does that work on us. Um, thank you for that. I'm gonna take one last set of hands. I'm gonna start with Mufelo and then Zayn, and then it's the anybody else. Um, the reason at the back. Thank you. My, my comment is basically to agree with Rabab about the insidious form of violence that accompanies state building, which entails the veiling and throttling if not co-opting, but jettisoning voices or forms of organization and power mm -hmm. outside of the state and related mm -hmm. institutions, unless such voices or spaces serve to entrench the dominant discourse or is related to the state. For example, in South Africa, even narratives about the history and evolution of social movements is often restricted to the mass democratic movement because of its relationship to the ruling African National Congress. Even when they say gross consultation, they mean consulting some Goko, Sanko, and the tripartite alliance, not about Sanbas and John Dolo and the privatization forum, and so on. So I think for me that is important. The other thing is that the whole thing is related to the relationship between economism and statism. The idea that human freedom is possible only through economy and only the state and the market can push economic development, which therefore means that the human beings, uh, society are constructed as consumers of rights and services given to them by the state and the whole. 
Okay, so when you make a uh, big set of hands, <laughs> I'm going to push you guys to uh, summarize if you have like a long point or question, please, in less than a minute. That's two quick set of questions. Okay, I'll be quick. <laughs> One is, we are talking about states and forms of states and, and society, and civil society. But we haven't been talking about possibly one of the bigger elephants in the room, which is multinationals in the globalized world and the role that they play in, in, in state formation, in the modern state formation, in the agency. So who has agency in modern states? Um, and maybe the, the last, you know, linked up to the last um, question is, you know, where's the weaker voices, where's the dominant voices, where they have companies like, like Apple, uh, a one trillion dollar, Company which is bigger than most uh, economies, and and where do they where do they fit into all of this? And then the second question uh, is really around again state, religion, and society. So we talk about political Islam, and people think what we, we know what we mean by that, but it's code word for Islam, Islamization. But you know, I'm, I'm talking tomorrow on a similar issue in Uganda around secularism in Africa, but we're also talking about political Christianity. So we can think about Tony Blair, for example. Um, and often political Christianity is, is also called word for conservative secularism. Um, and and so, you know, so maybe some comments on, on the different forms of political religion that have emerged, the, the, how they intersect with the state, um, the rise of Orthodox churches and oligarchs in, 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 in parts of Eastern Europe and how that has impacted on state formation. First, thank you for a very interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, my question is actually directed to uh, Professor Abdul Khadr, and uh, with regards to, I know it was a very short presentation and you couldn't expand uh, on, on very pertinent issues, but uh, looking at, at this discourse, Islamic discourse, you know, um, building on each other without actually placing it within the social political um, uh, developments of Egypt, for example, uh, wouldn't that be a useful, a useful tool to do, to do so? I mean, looking at colonialism and the idea of modernity and Islam, Islamism as a response to that idea of modernity and that separation that um, uh, my friend Beck mentioned about uh, politics, which was um, the, that there wasn't a contradictory, contradictory relationship between um, um, Islam and politics, for example, but then suddenly because of modernity and colonialism, this starts to exist, then we see these kind of responses by Maududi, um, say, Hassan Ben Nasser, and then Again, looking at the military regime that comes afterwards, then we see a, 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 a trend of uh, modern, modernizing or moderating Islam to fit within the new uh, political context, if you could respond. Thank you. Um, I don't have comments. I just actually wanted to ask a question uh, myself about uh, Rabab talked earlier about, uh, mentioned the BDS call and how it is presented as a call by civil society where in fact it's a political, social movement, religious, nationalist organizations. And I wanted to ask her what she thinks is behind it and what are the implications. My impression is that internationally at least it grants a greater legitimacy to and it's easier for people internationally to accept the call that comes from civil society organizations than Arab nationalist and Islamic movements. Um, but is it really the case? And if it is the case, what is the downside of that uh, locally and globally? Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, just a short responses. I think thank you very much for these for these questions and the comments, Buffalo. I'm just wondering whether you think that the state is completely un in control of things. I mean, if, if one thinks about specific cases as such, I mean, uh, I hear what you're saying in general, but I'm wondering whether one can formulate a thesis that uh, you know sometimes the state is also concerned about the fact that lots of things fall out of its of its power. But perhaps that's just my own. Sense of it. Uh, the, with respect to Zain and the last question on political Islam or political Christianity, and, and speaking about the context, I think they are, you are addressing the similar things. I think you are right 
and that's a whole space that needs to be spoken about as such. What I was trying to do in this presentation and what I have done before is actually to track the way in which uh, religious discourse changes. So it, it, in a way, I, I, I do think that you know, in the 1920s when the Muslim Brothers emerged and the, the shape that they took, you have to basically contextualize this and then you have to look at you know, uh, the October Revolution and then what set up. Each of these different periods you know, uh, were speaking about it. As I was writing about these books, I was thinking I must mention some context, but you know I was also given a short time. So, but thanks for that. But I also want to I also want to propose that perhaps that's a different way of doing what I was doing. And so normally what happens is that when we speak about in, in this case Muslim intellectuals, we just use them as information. What I was doing that I was actually showing them as people intellectuals who are thinking a different, who are changing the terms of the discourse. And for their organizations, they go through a lot of, as you know, they go through a lot of debates, so they create new ideas, and these ideas then spread out in different places as such, whether we agree with them or not. So that's why I was uh, uh, sacrificing the political context. But I have no doubt what you are saying, that one has to look at, you know, certainly when one thinks about the broader context of, of, of society and religions, religions are one of those organizations, maybe in response to Prophet now that I'm thinking about it, what Zain is saying, you know, you can maybe begin to see to what extent are they co-opted by the states, how are they then independent. I actually think, maybe because I'm a scholar of religion, that religion provides some kind of an escape from the state. You know, even whether it means you're going to move into the mountains and become a hermit, or whether it means you're, you're not going to be worried about paying your taxes because you think the state is corrupt and it is, in, it is, in, it is un, unlawful. I mean, those kind of gestures we have to take into consideration as well. But at the same time, there's a lot of, uh, you know, multinationals. I mean, multinationals are selling halal, they're selling, selling religion, right, all the time. So I think that you know, the question is important, and I think we need to raise it in a, in a proper way as well, to, just to begin to see how uh, uh, new waves of religions, particularly, I think, are falling much more, much more in line with consumerism and the multinationalism, and then they also get supported by the state. But this is an old, as old a story as modernity, right? I mean, the state has always been working with religion. Never, there's only been a facade of that we are opposed to it, opposed to all religion. So I'm, I'm going to just like say a couple, one word, a couple of words about each one. Um, the question of uh, the multinationals, I think, uh, I, I mean, the states, I know at least in the, in the case of uh, the quasi, Palestinian Authority and so on, there is no agency, obviously, but the, in many other states as well. And I think it's also the question of, do, the, is there any really a choice anyway? And if they had to choose, what would they do? So in the case of the Palestinian Authority, for example, does the Palestinian Authority want to continue being the way it is in its relationship to the colonial uh, um, framework of Oslo and the colonial framework of the US multinationals, Europe, and so on? Or does it want to be really a leader of a people? And can it, if it wants to? Not can it because is it want to or doesn't want to, but is it going to be able to, if that happens with the Palestinian Authority, does the Palestinian Authority remain the Palestinian Authority? Or does it change what it is? The question of, uh, and I think the question of Islam is, uh, the, the political question is, to me it relates to the two questions about colonialism and modernity as well, because it is about the whole question of what is secular really about secularization? Are we talking about secular fundamentalism? I mean, re that's, that's really what we're talking about. And if we talk about uh, political Islam or Christian, I mean, what is it? Uh, yeah, um, political Christianity, political, let's talk about political Jewishness, political Hinduism, political, I mean, religion has been used throughout the years about that. So I think it's a question of demystifying the whole idea of Islam and the exceptionalization of it and the exceptionality. The last point about the BDS, Ron, is that I think, yeah, I definitely agree that it is used in terms of quote-unquote marketing because it has a currency on the international scene and so on. What I was trying to show is that when people think, say, what is civil society, does not necessarily have the same content of it, number one, like theoretically speaking, it is not. But also, it does make, does make it really problematic for how you then mobilize. 
Because then everybody thinks this is about civil society. So, and in Palestinian, I mean, I don't really think that many people have even read the whole call or whatever, but sometimes people have problems with it, especially if they are a grassroots activists who are not part of the NGOs, who are not trying to submit grants to international NGO organizations, and they stick in the term civil society, and so on and so forth. And what does that then mean to the whole process of being able to actually even build the movement? And it's not even a question of indigenous authentic movement or not, because this is the context. At the end of the day, you are dealing in a particular political economic political economy, particular military aspect that it is, and, but it also makes it very difficult on the outside to mobilize and for what you can mobilize. You can mobilize around BDS, but if you want to come and start talking about other questions within even the BDS, the, the three terms and so on, makes it very, very difficult. So it's actually, so there is one aspect of political expediency for mobilization and, and building a movement and so on. There is another aspect which are, which leaves the bigger question of the people who are actually involved in it. Not only how do you translate it, but actually when you say something, are you really being heard? It takes us back to speedbacks. Can the subaltern speak? And if you, the subaltern speak, can it be heard? And what does it, what is being heard and what is not? And then how do you affect social change, whether locally or internationally? Uh, thank you.